So there I am, 20% of the way through editing a video on Fabio Paratici, Tottenham's new sporting director. And would you believe it? Tottenham say that they're going to appoint a manager quickly and they actually do it. Based off the last 50 days, who saw that coming? But Let's get serious. At the time of recording, Paolo Fonseca is in advanced talks to join Tottenham Hotspur as their new manager. Now, as previous uh, appointments from Daniel Levy have gone, this still might not happen. Nevertheless, this video is going to give you the tactics, background, story and more of Paolo Fonseca. Paolo Fonseca was born in Mozambique in 1973, but by the age of nine he had moved to Portugal and he had fallen in love with football as he had made his professional debut by the time he was 14 years old. Fonseca actually moved to Porto at the age of 22 in 1995, but he never made an appearance for the club. Still, he did play for some high profile Portuguese clubs like uh, Vitoria Guimaraes. In 2004 though, he retired at the age of 32. Why? Because he was moving straight into coaching. He started in the youth of his first club, which was Estrela Amadora. After two years there, he took the top job at, I'm gonna say this the English way, Dezembro. He didn't spend more than a year though though, something that would become a common trend in his career. He would move to some other clubs where he would never attain the win percentage over 45%. The big break though came at Pacos de Ferreira. They had just finished 10th in the 11-12 league in off season and they took Fonseca on board. In his only year there, Fonseca would guide Pacos de Ferreira to third spot. Fonseca achieved on average 1.93 points per game, which for context is better than Maurizio Sarri managed at Chelsea in his only campaign there. He led them to Champions League qualification, which was enough to get the attention of FC Porto. Fonseca was joining the Porto side that had just won the league title the third time in a row unbeaten with their only real embarrassment coming in the Champions League where they were beaten by a Malaga in the round of 16. Fonseca joined on a two-year deal calling it an honour to represent the champions and that he couldn't have been happier and he said he wanted to instill dominating possession and uh, play a high tempo. It's arguable he had the team for it too. In defence he had Mangada and Otamendi in the middle flanked by Danilo, Ricardo Pereira and Alexandro. In midfield they had uh, Stefan de Foro and Fernando and up front they had the cult figure Jackson Martinez. In the 13-14 campaign, he grabbed 29 goals in 51 appearances across all competitions. This was not enough to stop Porto dropping down the league low as Fonseca's side lost seven times and they were in third position by the time he was sacked in mid-March. In the Champions League, Porto had lost at home to Zenit, which relegated them to the Europa League where they eventually went out to Sevilla. After his sacking, Fonseca returned to Pacos de Ferreira and then SC Braga. He took them to fourth spot, matching the previous season's position and points total, but he did win the Portuguese Portuguese Cup and took them to the Europa League quarterfinals. Just as a Porto, uh, Fonseca lined up with a back four, but rather than a 4-2-3-1, he, he played a 4-4-2 with attacking wingers that would cut inside. Now after this season, 2015-16, Fonseca was moving to his first club outside of Portugal, Shakhtar Donetsk. At the time Fonseca joined Shakhtar, they had just lost Alex Chichera, who of course was the world's most impressive youngster for about a month. And they had failed to win the Ukraine Premier League, always losing out to Dynamo Kiev for the past two seasons. Off the pitch there were issues too, as Shakhtar was suffering from the ongoing political crisis in Ukraine and specifically their region. Fonseca was joining a side where he was unable to speak Russian or the native language. Fortunately being Portuguese, he could speak with the uh, Brazilian contingent of the Shakhtar squad. This is where we see the making of Fonseca though, as we saw that he kept his style, a 4-2-3-1. He put Bernard into attacking midfield. On the wings were Tyson and Marlos, who together contributed to 37 goals in his first campaign. Just as at Porto and Braga, Shakhtar's attacks came through the wide men, with over 77% of attacks coming through the wide channels. As Football Grad points out, the thing with Fonseca's side is that they'll often look like a hybrid of a 4-2-3-1 and a 4-4-2, able to fluidly move in between the two depending on the opposition. The improvement was ginormous so Shakhtar won the league by 13 points, conceding just 24 goals in 32 games and scoring over 60. Fonseca would win the league three times with Shakhtar every year he was in charge. This was vital for Shakhtar as it helped him bring in the Champions League money and they spent that on players like Marcus Antonio and Tete, two of the world's most uh, exciting youngsters at the moment. Fonseca did this too despite losing Fred and Bernard in the summer of 2018. Forming Europe was more patchy though, as in every year of Fonseca's time in charge, Shakhtar got relegated out of the Champions League group stages, put into the Europa League round of 32 and went out there every single time. Still as mentioned, Fonseca's style would become solidified. He would be known for playing a 4-2-3-1 slash 4-4-2 in quite pressing style, playing a lot through the wide men, getting them to cut inside and getting huge numbers out of them. He was focused on dominating possession with the two centre backs being focused on build-up play and the DMs in the 4-2-3-1 dropping deep to maintain possession. Fonseca had become a serious 
serial winner in Ukraine and really improving the talents like Fred and Bernard. As well as getting more out of players like Marlos Tyson and future Atalanta forward Viktor Kovalenko. Overall, Shakhtar Fonseca won 74% of his games. Now, this success brought him his first move into Europe's top five leagues with AS Roma. Now, there's a lot of negative feeling attached to Fonseca's time in charge with Roma, but I want to give it a bit of background because when he took over, the squad was appalling. They had just come off the stint of Monchi, the former Sevilla sporting director, and in my opinion, he completely ruined the team. In the summer Fonseca joined, key players like Alisson and Raja Nyongalan had left. In the previous summer, over 100 million had been spent on Patrick Schick, Drafel, Justin Cliver, and Steven Nzonzi. The age profile of the squad was disgusting. Dzeko was probably their only recognised goal scorer. Pretty much, this was a club already in decline. In the summer Fonseca took over, Roma burnt more money on Brian Costante and goalkeeper Paolo Lopez. This was also the summer that Roma decided to pursue OAPs like uh, Chris Smalling and Mkhitaryan. Lopez was the real blunder. He was a goalkeeper brought in from Raul Batiste, and in his first season in the Serie A, he committed three errors leading to a goal. He would keep five clean sheets in 32 games. Despite that, in Fonseca's first season, Roma would finish fifth. He kept his 4-2-3-1 style, moving Luca Pellegrini into to midfield with a Dzeko staying up front in that static forward mould. He scored 16 goals that season with his heat map showing how he really didn't spend any time in his own half. But Fonseca was hindered by his wide men. Cloiver and Cengiz Under were really not up to scratch. Despite completing the second and third most dribbles per night in the squad, they didn't even contribute over 10 goals between them in the league. Fonseca's system was designed to get more out of the wide men and that isn't very helpful if your wide men aren't up to Serie A level. Perhaps this weakness was part of the reason why Fonseca actually changed things up for one of the first times in his career. In the 2021 season, he played a 3-4-1-2. Now, this was clever because it did get more out of the wing-backs. Rick Karlsdorp and Leandro Spinazzola, the former, really rejuvenated his career under Paolo Fonseca. Still on the wings, with Under and Clover leaving, Roma really only brought in El Stefan El Shawari and Pedro. Despite this, some of the forwards did perform well. Luca Pellegrini played well again, and Mkhitaryan contributed to 23 goals last season. However, one of the clear reasons to switch to a back three was to help the defence, and it didn't work. Much like Kepa Ariza Balaga in 2019-20, Lopez was actually rotated out for 37-year-old backup keeper Antonio Mirante. That didn't stop Roma finishing seventh, conceding 58 goals in 38 games. That is a dreadful record. Across the Europa League and Serie A, the goalkeeper Lopez committed five errors. He conceded four goals outside of the box and in his Serie A appearances he only kept four clean sheets. Roma were poor in transition and that is a criticism that could be levelled against the teams like the Porto side uh, that Fonseca managed. However, the squad was so bad and it was so ill-suited to Fonseca's style that I feel quite harsh judging him for this. If anything, I would mark the Porto spell far more as a black mark on Fonseca's CV than his time in Roma. Let's not forget as well, he did lead Roma to the semi-finals of the Europa League, even though they were quite embarrassed against Man United. Maybe this is what Fabio Paratici saw in Fonseca Lowe to hire him at Tottenham Hotspur. Now let's get into the fit of the club. So we already know that Fonseca's going to try and get more out of his wired men, probably in a 4-2-3-1 rather than a 4-4-2. I don't want to speculate transfers here, one, because anything could change at any moment, as we've seen with Tottenham, and two, we don't know what approach Fabio Paratici is going to take. Maybe you can learn about that in the video that I was editing and will be uploaded soon. Look, in goal, we can expect Hugo Lloris to start still, and Fonseca will be glad to have anyone but a statue in between the sticks. At right back, I think a new man's going to be pursued, because even though Sergio is pretty good going forward, he commits too many errors defensively, and I think all Tottenham fans can agree with that statement. In defence, I'm not too sure what's going to happen here, because Alderweireld is a very good ball-playing centre-back, but I'm less sure on Eric Dyer, and ball-playing and possession-keeping is what's really important for the centre-backs in the Fonseca side. At left back of course will be uh, Sergio Reguilón. In midfield I think it's going to be still Hoiberg and uh, Los Celso but you can expect Hoiberg to be doing a lot less destroying than he was under Mourinho and be doing a lot more ball playing which in fairness he was very good at for Tottenham this season. At left mid Hyomin Son is going to remain but at right mid it's going to be interesting because Fonseca likes a bit of mobility and uh, cutting inside so I think it's a death sentence for Lucas Moura on the right and the battle between Lamella and Bale to see who can still have the energy 
strategy and uh, create more from the wide positions. In the attacking midfield spot, you can still expect to see Ndombele playing there, but rather as like a third midfielder under what he was under Mourinho, perhaps a little bit more as a fourth attacker. He is still going to drop deep and uh, link the play, but those flashes of brilliance we saw under on on the, on Ndombele in the attack, I think we're going to see a bit more of that under Fonseca as he's encouraged to get forward and maybe sometimes drop in with the striker, which will of course be Harry Kane. Well, that's if he doesn't leave. But assuming he stays, I think you're actually going to see a lot less of Kane as a playmaker and much more as a dead set striker. What Tottenham fans think of that, uh, you let me know down below. Now, apologies if that fit was a bit short. I will do a bit more on that once we see the players coming in and what we can expect of Tottenham. But hopefully you still enjoyed this video and please do look out for that Fabio Paratici video coming soon. Hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you soon.